Hello everyone, welcome to my channel and in today's video of our AMC1 series, we are going to discuss diabetic foot disease management. So in diabetic patients, uh, their feet are prone to uh, development of wounds and ulcers because of a number of reasons. So the first reason is these patients have uh, diabetic neuropathy. So they are not aware of subtle and minor injuries to their feet in, uh, in their uh, everyday life which can then lead to the development of a uh, wound and they can then get infected, okay? These patients also have peripheral arterial disease. So the blood flow to the feet is uh, impaired. Uh, it's not as good as it should be, uh, which also leads to the development of venous ulcerations, arterial ulcers. And um, when the blood flow is compromised, it also you know delays wound healing. And another reason for delayed wound healing in these uh, patients is their hyperglycemia. So as a result of hyperglycemia, their immunity is low and um, their wound healing is delayed. So let's see how can we, uh, what are the different steps of management of diabetic foot? So the first step here, when you have a patient who presents with um, diabetic foot, which involves wound and ulcers, what you are going to do is, first of all, you are going to examine the foot and you're going to debride any dead tissues surrounding the wound. Okay, so first, the first step is debridement and then swab. Okay, so first you will debride all the dead tissues and it will expose the, uh, you know, the wound and the wound edges. And then you're going to take swab from any any discharges um, or any white area. Okay, and you will send it to the uh, to lab for culture. After that, you will uh, do a wound dressing to prevent any further damage to the wound. Um, and you will start the patient on antibiotics. Antibiotics, well, you know, the type uh, of antibiotics and the route of antibiotics, whether you want to give oral or IV, will depend upon the extent of infection. And we'll discuss uh, it, about it in details shortly. Um, then the third step here is pressure offloading. So you don't want the patient to put any more pressure on the uh, already affected area. So you will uh, teach the patient different techniques to um, relieve the pressure so that when he's lying down in bed or sitting, uh, or sitting in a chair, um, he exerts the least pressure possible on the affected area. And you'll also help the patient to give them like specific kind of shoes or heel cushions or toe cushions too help with the pressure of loading, okay? So the third step is pressure of loading um, to help the wound heal faster. And then of course it's quite painful, so you will give analgesia. Uh, the fifth step here is to rule out osteomyelitis. So as a diabetic patient can develop skin wound and infection, but it can, as the wound goes deeper and deeper, it can involve the bone and lead to the development of bone infection, which is called osteomyelitis. So you need to rule out osteomyelitis because if the patient has developed osteomyelitis, then it changes your management. Okay, so the best, uh, so the best test for osteomyelitis uh, is MRI, but the initial one is X-ray. So first of all, you will do an X-ray. If you could find, if you could find osteomyelitis on X-ray, then you don't need to do any MRI. But if you can't find anything on X-ray, then you will proceed to MRI to rule out osteomyelitis. And the sixth and the seventh. Uh, step are basically management of the risk factors. So you will do uh, management of peripheral arterial disease if present, okay? So you will give aspirin for peripheral arterial disease and you will refer to vascular surgeon uh, to see if they can do any intervention to improve blood flow to the legs and feet. Um, and the seventh step is management of glycemic control, okay? So the first of all, you will debride any dead tissues uh, and you will swap the wound. Then you will dress the wound to prevent further, uh, to prevent further damage to the wound, and um, to you know, uh, help with the healing. And you will start the patient on antibiotics. You will do pressure offloading uh, to prevent further pressure on the affected area. You will give analgesia if if the patient is in pain, and then you will send the patient for investigations to rule out osteomyelitis. So the initial test to do is X-ray, and if you can't find anything on X-ray, then MRI is the gold standard. Uh, and then you will manage the risk factors. So you will manage peripheral arterial disease if present, and you will also manage glycemic control, okay? Now, let's see what type of antibiotics and which route of antibiotics we are going to give these patients. So 
let's say if the patient's wound is uninfected, okay, the patient has developed a wound, but the wound is uninfected. So the wound does not have any evidence of inflammation, which means that there is no redness, there is no warm, there is no swelling um, surrounding the wound. So no need for antibiotics in this case. You will just do the debridement and the dressing, pressure offloading, um, and, and, and analgesia if the patient is in pain, and then management of risk factors. You don't need to do MRI or X-ray because the wound is not infected. So if the wound is not infected, then there is no infection to spread to the bones. So you no need to rule out osteomyelitis here. Um, but if the wound does not have any evidence of inflammation, there is no redness, no warmth, no swelling, no discharge, but the wound is malodorous, then if the wound is malodorous, then we need to treat the wound as mild infection. Okay, but if the wound is, doesn't have any odor and no evidence of inflammation, then we don't give any antibiotics. Now, mildly infected wound is the one which has evidence of inflammation. So the skin surrounding the wound, so the wound is itself, it's kind of wet and discharging and the skin surrounding the wound is red, hot and there is swelling. So erythema is basically redness and cellulitis is basically infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. So if Let's suppose there is a wound and the skin surrounding the wound is there is redness, there is swelling, there is warmth, all the evidence of inflammation. But it's the area like the area surrounding the wound is less than two centimeter. Less than two centimeter of the area is uh, showing signs of uh, inflammation and infection, which is erythema and cellulitis. OK, there is no extension of the infection beyond the superficial subcutaneous tissue and there are no systemic sign, systemic sign and symptoms. So it's a very mild infection, which means that the wound itself is oozing um, discharge and the surrounding skin is red, swollen and warm. But the, only two less than two centimeters of the area surrounding the wound is um, showing evidence of inflammation and it's only limited to the uh, skin and the superficial subcutaneous tissue there is no extension of the infection beyond that and there are no systemic signs and symptoms which means that there is no fever or chills no tachycardia no low blood pressure or anything so we uh, we label this as mild infection and we give oral antibiotics so we give either oral amoxicillin plus clavulinate um, cephalexine plus metronidazole or if the patient is penicillin allergic then we can give ciprofloxacin plus clindamycin so one of them is covering uh, so amoxicillin and clavulinate cover gram positive and anaerobes both but cephalexine cover mostly gram positive so we aid uh, metronidazole for uh, the anaerobic coverage and here clindamycin is covering gram positive and gram uh, gram positive and anaerobes and ciprofloxacin is covering gram negative so these antibiotics we give orally. Then if the wound is moderately infected, um, which means that there is evidence of inflammation, so the wound is oozing um, discharge and the surrounding skin is red, hot and swollen, which is erythema and cellulitis, but now more than two centimeters of the area is involved. Okay, and the wound has, and the um, wound has extended beyond the superficial subcutaneous tissue. And there is gangrene, which means that there is some dead tissue as well. But there is no systemic involvement. Okay, So now the wound is infected. Surrounding skin is infected and inflamed. And it's uh, acquiring like the infection and inflammation is extending to more than 2 centimeters of the area surrounding the skin. And the infection and the wound is extended now and beyond the sub, uh, superficial subcutaneous tissue. So now it is extended deep into the deep subcutaneous tissue or even into the muscle. Okay, and now there is evidence of some dead tissue, which is gangrene, but still, it's still limited to the uh, to the foot and there is no systemic involvement, which means that there is no fever associated with it, no low blood pressure, tachycardia, chills, etc. So, um, we'll give the patient IV antibiotics, so IV um, flucloxacillin or dicloxacillin, which are antistaphylococcal uh, anti penicillin. And if the wound is malodorous, then for gram uh, for anaerobic coverage, we will also add metronidazole because flucloxacillin is exclusively uh, gram positive coverage. Now, severe infection is the one where the signs of infection is now spread to the uh, you know systemic signs and symptoms. So it means that the infection is now spread to the blood, and there is sepsis. So patient will have fever triggers and chills, the patient will have tachycardia and low blood pressure, the patient may be confused and vomiting. So all those signs and symptoms of sepsis. 
This patient, we now we will give IV broad spectrum antibiotics like IV piperacillin and tazobactam, IV tecorcelin and clavulinate. So this was all about management of diabetic foot. Um, and if you found this video helpful, please subscribe my channel. Um, and I'll see you soon in the next video.